jumped in at the back. Would that be the barn? Uh, if not painted, nonetheless. To well, the other side of the tree. Yeah. 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 Well, I know there's stables, and then later, and I haven't seen a good photo, there was a stable for his horse. Because the, the story I love is he, he, you know, he, he shows up somewhere, there's a medical emergency in town, and he's, he's just covered in water, shaking off everything. And they said, I, the whole doctor, I'm so glad you came. I, I, I'd hate to have you and the name of his horse, which is escaping me at the moment, Julia, uh, to bring you and Julia out on such a, a difficult uh, evening. And he said, oh, no, no, the storm's too bad. I left Julia at home. <laughs> his horse was aging. So there were stables, and I believe they'd be the equivalent to uh, across the street, slightly to the left of where St. Anne's uh, is, schoolhouse is today, something like that. And I know that there is a carriage house that shows up in some of the surveys. So, you know, as time goes on, we're still trying to learn a little bit about some of the structures and who's where. This is from a fire insurance plan that shows the guy this house, Helmican House, and a mysterious house in the middle. But you'll see in this one, which is uh, we're scaling that one. Uh, well, I don't think the date of that particular fire insurance plan. But you see the house is shown shown in three sections. Mm -hmm. So that's after the balloon construction that puts the two-story part of the house on, on which is framing. Uh, oh. And it also shows the street, Elliot. Yes. And so here's Elliot Street. This, this is from the insurance, fire insurance plan in 1911. These all got digitized out of our archives and are up online at, at the University of Victoria now. Uh, so Elliott Street is there, uh, but you can see that other house is now gone by 1911. The Douglas House is gone. Uh, and you can see some houses on what becomes Government Street going down to the corner. So it's all kind of getting cleared out, except for for Helmican House, and you can see he now has a carriage house, which is um, just behind the entrance to the kitchen mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, and, and that is becomes a car garage, and uh, from carriage house to car garage, and then that gets torn down when really unruly neighbors move into the neighborhood and build something called the RBCM, <laughs> <laughs> much to the chagrin of the curator who lived in the two-story part of the house because she had to put up with all the construction and she lost the garage for her car and et cetera, et cetera. And the letters were written about her, about noisy uh, uh, janitorial staff talking, going by her bedroom window at 2 a.m. Something must be done. Writes a letter to the provincial librarian who's her boss, who gets very tired of these letters and is so glad to see her transferred in 1975 to the Department of Recreation and Conservation with the house, which comes back to us in 2002. Yeah. Now, why aren't we moving? Maybe that file is crooked. There's a building on the far right, or lower right. Uh, a series of other uh, small houses. Oh, uh, yeah. The, Windshield in uh, in the in the lower right. Must be the because it doesn't want to move. Hmm. Our need is locked up on me. Somewhere between 1911 to the 1920s, that's what the house looked like when Elliot was there. You can see Elliotism didn't pay. You can see the glass structure that for the middle part of the house. That's the door. As you walk in the front door, you turn to the right, there's a door there. It went into there. Now we know that uh, um, Dolly's sister is married to Mr. McTavish and he runs a series of greenhouses. So is this a sunroom for the doctor to sit in in the cold of winter? Or is this for propagation of plants for the garden? It doesn't look like they would have much of a place to have a garden. It looks like the fence is all encroaching on that. Oh, nothing in the front for the garden. 
garden would be behind and going down and, and the area to the uh, along this way. Yeah. And there's a view from across the street, so there are very few houses. The area is sort of emptying out a little bit, but I like this one because you see the Empress peeking over. Mm -hmm. So we know this is after 1911 when the Empress is built for time periods. So you can see uh, a, a power line for electricity or telephones even, uh, and a different view of the greenhouse structure. Uh, then we're more into the 1940s or 50s. You can see that there's a bit of a structure here, which is an entrance into Thunderbridge Park. Uh, I can't quite make out what house pole that is, but it's, it's that structure, sort of a, a southern entrance to Thunderbridge Park. Um, more complicated, the telephone poles are different and more complicated. Um, there's a, now a paved sidewalk through there. So Thunderbird Park was there before the museum? Thunderbird Park existed, uh, they started building it in 1942. Oh. People don't say nice things about the end of Fannin's career, but what I find tantalizing is he was part of the group that created Thunderbird Park. Oh. One of the things that created Thunderbird Park was um, the BC Provincial Police had uh, totem poles uh, stored in their drill barracks. When World War II came out, they needed to turn it back into uh, a militia uh, drill unit for the war. Uh, so what did they do with these totem poles? And the, the head of the BC Police uh, said, we should put them up, and Fannin said, what a great idea, and Thunderbird Park was created and had those poles erected, which solved the problem of emptying the large building on the right behind the legislature so it can be used for military defense and training. They're worried about attacks and invasions and Japanese bombing and raids and things like that. Um, and, and the BC police had the polls for uh, a number of reasons, not the least of which was there was a, um, an illegal traffic trade smuggling them out to collectors in the US. It's easy to just put a, a get a tug, pull it to the shore and, and sail off of it. So there's some of that. It, it's, as far as, nobody's done a really good uh, research into it that, I, uh, that I've seen yet, but it seems to be something like that. It doesn't look to me as if it total cultural um, uh, cultural genocide. You know, get the poles, tear them down. If you're just tearing them down to destroy them, you'd tear them down and burn them. You wouldn't tear them down and carefully store them in a warehouse in Victoria. It's and it's not clear. Is this done with permission? Has somebody said, you know, somebody should do something about the poles at, at this abandoned village or no longer used village? Uh, people have been coming and looked, they've taken one already. You've got to do something. Uh, don't know. Haven't seen the files. Really, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting question to ask. How did they end up with them? Why? Yeah. And there should be files because the BC police files are in the archives. Anyway, the, the idea is instigated somehow by the head of the BC police with Fannin at the museum. And so they build Thunderbird Park. And Queen Elizabeth, uh, Princess Elizabeth, and her husband, Prince Philip, come and there's an event that we have programs for in ethnology, because I found them and transferred them up. Uh, and they come to see a performance of Cowichan and Salish dancers in Thunderbird Park during the royal visit. And there is no museum here at all. So Thunderbird Park is actually old, older as a cultural performance space, if you will, uh, than the museum itself. Older than the Longhouse. Longhouse is built in uh, 1951, 52. I was at the 50th anniversary. Yeah, so, so by this point, by the 19, 1938, 39, the provincial archivist is walking to work past the picket fence and talking to Dolly as he goes by. And whenever there's a question about Confederation and the early history, he stops in to have tea and ask her if there's anything in her father's files, which she won't let him see. <laughs> They're in the darkened back part of the house. And she loves having the provincial archivist come and sit in the parlor and have tea. And she says, I'll just be a minute. She disappears into the back of the house and comes back with a really interesting letter or an answer to the question 
or something like that. And he's hooked. He's got to have these papers. And she's, she muses at one of the thieves that she's thinking that private things should stay private. She'll have them all burned when she dies. Mm -hmm. And he's going, no, it's the only record of confederation, etc., etc. So he starts basically wooing her for her archival pawns <laughs> and talking to the family. And when Dolly dies, the papers are purchased by the province from the family and placed in the archives. That's what the book is built out of. It's a really great collection. In the deal, the house comes with it. But the family has the right to go in and take away anything they want. So there's an inventory of what's in the house after the family burns off the things. But we don't have a list of what the family took. Uh, and by 1941-42, they have a housing shortage in Victoria. Uh, you're not allowed, on, the government will not allow you to move to Victoria without a permit in the war. It's a closed zone uh, for production because of housing issues. Uh, so everybody's desperate to find a house, uh, put the house that they can stay in. Um, a librarian, a male librarian from the ledge, stays briefly in the house so that it's occupied and there aren't squatters. Uh, and he goes to work in the library. Uh, and they finally hire a curator for it. And the first curator moves in, her husband is a foreman for public works, and he takes care of fixing up the house, and they live in the two-story part of the house, and every morning she goes down with the keys, she unlocks this, and by 1942, the house has become uh, um, a, a museum, a heritage site that's open for tours. Uh, a few more views of the house. And there's a sign up there uh, that points out, uh, uh, and that door becomes the main door for entering the, the museum part. It's also the oldest original door. Uh, there's a long history to that curatorship. I'm going way over time. But what I'm moving into here are pictures of how it's been shown at different times. And uh, this looks great to people. But as a historian starts looking into it, you start finding out, doing inventories and finding out the doll is a doll from the 1930s. There were no children in the house even playing with dolls in the 1930s. You know, what's going on here? Somebody brought this in to, to give an effect and, and, and all of that. They had dolls in the 1930s. Oh, yes. They did. Yeah. But by that point, Dr. Hamilton has been oh, dead is. 10 years mm -hmm. and Dolly's 80 something. <laughs> but she didn't have any children. But yeah, there's there's her nieces and nephews. But, uh, so then we went back and found out in the 1940s, as it opened as a museum, the Hudson's Bay uh, Beeper magazine sent a photographer out, and they photographed what the museum looked like when it first opened. So we got this photo. That's what it was when it first became a museum, and this is it is what it is after much love is poured into the room by many generations of curators and volunteers uh, trying to make it look a little better. But pay attention to the walls, all the stuff on the walls. Very sparse. So this is as close to original, you'd think. But we don't know if this room was totally empty after the family took things away. We doubt they took the wardrobe. We're pretty sure they didn't take the beds, the you know, washstands and so forth. So when we were looking at, at restoring it, um, and this is one of my favorite, this is, this is the dining parlor. Uh, uh, there's the piano. So that piano is towards the modern main entrance, that wall. Um, and there's the room. And there's the room. The piano has just shifted, and now there's a cabinet over against that wall, and now it has fancy wallpaper. 60s and 70s. Tables changed a little bit. There's an awful lot more things in there. There's Hamilton's medical chest full of off acid toxic chemicals. <laughs> Passed around sniffing. Pulmonate of mercury. Explosives out of that. So this is in the 1950s. And there's the first curator. And she's explaining some of the glassware. 
showing some of the text of his text of stories. Um, it was really interesting. The, mo most of the tours were school, school tours, but the museum was closed in, in uh, January and February because it was too cold because there was no central heating. Mm -hmm. And the school groups wouldn't go in because it was too cold for the children. So that became an, a, a seasonal issue. Um, Lori Wallace speaking at the reopening of Helmington House in uh, 1963, a complete renovation. Lifted the whole place up, put a foundation, put central heating in, put a furnace down in the basement. Uh, Public Works did all of, all, all of this. Uh, and this was a, a, a pre-centennial project for the Premier's office. And, and the sign announcing the museum is hanging there. We still have that sign. Uh, one of the creases unveiling the plaque. We don't know where the plaque went. <laughs> and there's Premier Bennett in Helmington House with his wife, May, with the curator and her husband. Uh, Creighton, pioneers, etc. There's a lot of interesting politics. They made the decision to pour money into Helmington House they made the decision to not save another heritage house. There were a lot of heritage activists who were very mad about that. Um, uh, and uh, Mrs. Webster and her husband on the right. Her husband, her husband has a stroke. He's in St. Joseph's Hospital. She goes to see him every day at lunch from, from the museum. Um, and then they say he's not going to get better. He's transferred to long-term care, but it's further away. Um, and uh, she can't get to him at lunchtime, what to do. And uh, she, she worked, uh, she was paid by the provincial uh, secretary at the library. Um, got the job in 1942, the next year their only child died. Finds out she has no pension. Um. W. A. C. Bennett brought in pensions for civil servants. You, you think of them as a right wing social credit kind of guy, but he actually put in a pension plan for civil servants and made it more formal. He, and as an entrepreneur, he nationalized like a socialist hydro, the ferries, uh, the telephone system, all of these kinds of things. Uh, really interesting character. Uh, it was, that other people, as time goes on, he looks more and more significant uh, rather than less significant. You know, some politicians fade away. Uh, anyway, uh, so Mrs. Webster has no pension. And three supervisors, all male, including the uh, provincial librarian, uh, write to the pension board and they go back and forth and go, it can't be done. We can't get her a pension. Because the act said you had to register in 1952 within 10 months to be transitioned into the new pension system. She was never transitioned. We can't retroactively add somebody's service uh, now. You know, that's been there since 1942. And I'm reading all these letters, I'm like, oh, this is ridiculous. And, and, they, and they can't, they get the correspondence goes back and forth. So Mrs. Webster writes to May Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> woman to woman. I have this difficult thing. And, I hesitate to bother your husband because he's very important in doing so many important things. But here is my situation, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I have no pension. Perhaps you could talk to your husband. A lovely little letter. Three weeks later, uh, Mrs. Webster gets an order in council signed by the Premier and gets a pension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 50% pension on a very small salary. salary. So I just love that story. I just love it. Uh, so there they are in, in Helmican House. And he, teetotaling, and I'm not quite sure what's in the little bottle. They're all having fun. Um, and it's at Helmican House that the Premier announces at that opening that he's going to launch a centennial project four years into the future and they're going to build a new provincial archives and a new provincial museum. Hmm. And that's actually announced at Helmington House as, as a centennial project. There's some of the newspaper clippings from that. 
So our history as a museum is tied to Helmut and House. This is Webster retires, the new curator comes in, and there are some fabulous friction point incidents with, mm -hmm. as construction comes up. Um, my favorite one where somebody refuses, somebody is asked to pay, and he produces a $10 bill. She has, have you got any change? No, I don't have to change, you'll have to change. Well, I'm not changing that, et cetera, et cetera. So from the curator, and, and it ends in a confrontation with, between a large portly man with his wife and three children and the curator, and, and he says, well, I've offered to pay, you wouldn't take it, I'm gonna see this place anyways, come along, children, and, and she's, Furious, and that her summer student is furious, is watching this, and all that. And she chases the visitor out into the street, saying, "You're probably an American." <laughs> <laughs> and he says, "I'll have you know, madam, that I'm from Vancouver." <laughs> and then he writes a letter to the papers and to the minister. Mm. And so there's all this correspondence that goes down. Well, what did she do? She goes, "Oh, fuck off." <laughs> anyway, so the library is pulling his hair out. And then eventually this is all transferred to another ministry. Uh, so, so the building of the museum created friction points because people weren't going to go into Helmington House when there was a brand new museum next door that was new. And it made it a difficult time for the house uh, uh, through the 1970s into the 1980s. And you can see there's the museum finished, the road is paved, see the changing vehicle. And so Helmican House remains somewhat in the shadow uh, of the museum until in, in the um, later 1970s, Elliott Square is constructed as an 1971-1871 centennial project with no money and it gets delayed and delayed and delayed. And so the street is closed off and becomes the urban space that you see now. Uh, and at that time, the house is being uh, run by the Heritage Branch and the museum is actually receiving and running St. Anne's across the square from it. Mm -hmm. And it's not until 2002 that they become merged into the same agency. Mm. Uh, the woman on the porch who's not very tall is uh, um, Jim Wardrop, the history section's wife. Uh, when they married, she had to transfer elsewhere and she went to run uh, uh, one of the other sites at uh, Teresa Molinaro. Um, and under the Heritage Branch, uh, they were dealing with the lead paint issue, lead paint remediation, which is being peeled off the house and, and replaced with non-toxic paints. Um, there are different views as the heritage uh, um, groups start looking at heritage house colors, how to differentiate the different eras of the house. Christmas programs are set up, and a DHS film, a, a Helmut and Christmas, is created with trained actors playing a key role in the running of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, although interestingly, uh, we now know that there was a Chinese house servant and they didn't know then, and that's not in, in the film. And uh, my favorite hootenanny kumbaya signal on uh, occurring on the porch uh, in the 1980s. So through the 1980s, public interpretation was very much focused on reproduction heritage mm -hmm. costumes and the living history much like Williamsburg in Virginia, uh, which was happening on all the sites administered by the Heritage Branch. Interpretation and costume was, was very big. Um, Helmet and Christmas, uh, typical pub public programs, which we, we still do. Um, and was that, it, was that in the dining room, or what, was that the parlor? <laughs> oh, that was the oh, kitchen? Oh, sorry, uh, that, that's the parlor. That's the parlor, yeah. oh. Just looks very different now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh no, I think the parlor is the same, but the sofa's under the window in that shot. Well, no wallpaper. Well, the wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, the wallpaper is part of the, the uh, 2005 restoration. Yeah. yeah. But the wall, there was actually uh, the wall. I thought people asked him about the wallpaper on the ceiling. Was it was. That, it was. It era, was, was done, but it drives people crazy. But was it done in that era? Was there a certain number of years that they actually put wallpaper on the ceiling? Yes. Yes. It, it, it is done. Yeah. At that point in time. But it, it throws people off no end. <laughs> and you know, it's an interpreting element. I think Kate Kerr was involved in that one, um, and we talked about it. 
but we don't have a photograph of the inside of the parlor in the 1930s when the family lived there, right? So that we can look at what was being done. So what I've tried to do with the in interpretation is when you play with a heritage building, try to keep that to the two-story part of the house and for the midsection and the back to go back to the oldest known photos of each right. room and try to corral it like no props past this point. So that was just like the era, that was the era where they actually would pay for the ceiling and so that's why it was done that way there. In yes. some places, some places in some heritage now. houses, did they, they do it here? Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm desperate for a modern photo album from the house that gives us information on the two story parts of the house. Because mm -hmm. we have furniture, we can do more interpretation, but we don't have any evidence of what actual use was. Whereas we do have photographs for the middle section from the family dinner, from both ends of that room. And for the back, we have photos that were taken in 1942, which are the oldest photos we can get to. But for the rest of the house, it was so lived in that we have no uh, visual data in the case. Yeah. Uh, and then in, after uh, 87, because we got our royal designation in 87, and the idea spread that heritage should pay its way, that you should pay to go into the Royal BC Museum and Barker Hill and Fort Steele, and all heritage sites should be self-funding, which is a bit naive once you start, start figuring out what it costs to put a heritage roof on a building. Uh, odds of paying that off are, are pretty slim. So by the late 1990s, up to 2002 when it's transferred, there are experiments with privatization, not of the ownership, but with contracts to run it. So a young couple ran the house in historic costume and turned the kitchen 